running. As soon as I heard the familiar sound of that white Nova with the black vinyl roof, I went running out of the carport and then down in the street, Comanche Court. I really didn't care if I faced myself, made a scene, or made a fool of myself. All I cared about was taking inventory of that car as it was put into park in our carport. I counted one, two, one, two. All were counted for. And a wave of joy just wafted over the top. The day, however, did not start off joyous. I had acted bad. So badly, in fact, that I remember that time poignantly and painfully this 37 or 38 years later. I had come in from the field oh, uh, two days before, on a Friday. I'd been in the field pushing troops for 30 days. I came in, as you can imagine, I was dirty, I was tired, I was hungry, and I was grumpy. Um, and I came home, was able to rest, had a great Saturday with Kay, our, my wife, and our, our only child at that point, Clay, just a toddler. But then Sunday came along, and of course, <coughs> as soon as the sun came up, Kay was up getting herself ready for church, as she's always done our whole 40 years of marriage. Getting herself ready for church, getting, getting Clay ready uh, for church. Uh, we went to a tiny little Episcopal parish about 30 or 40 minutes away from us. Kay and I taught Sunday school there. We did the youth group there. And our little family made up a full tenth of the congregation. <laughs> Kay was getting ready to do what, well, we were supposed to do. But I was still in the bed. I was still in the bed. And I was kind of hemming and hawing about, you know, I didn't know if I was going to go or not. And then I started talking about how tired I was. And then it intensified with the Lord and said, doesn't anybody understand how worn out I am? And before I knew it, that turned into anger. And then it got past anger, and my will, my willfulness kicked in, and I just threw a tantrum. <laughs> and Kay did what Kay does. She took our little, our, our little two-year-old, put him in his car seat. She got in the driver's seat of that Nova, and she pulled out of the carport. And I'll never forget as long as I live stepping out on the Comanche court and watching the back end of that double go down the street. Going to where I should have been going. Going to where I should have been going. And along with the people I love more than any in the whole world. But there I was. Marking time. Marking time. Pretty good. No wonder I remember. Let me tell you. That morning and that early afternoon continued slowly and agonizingly. I went inside, I washed the dishes, I washed all the family's clothes, I shined all my boots. I shined boots I didn't even wear anymore. I did anything I could do but look in the mirror because I did not want to see that pitiful 20-something-year-old lieutenant. I wanted to do anything but look at him. And then, about mid-afternoon, after youth group and all that was over, I heard, I heard the familiar sound of that white Nova coming around the corner in Comanche Village. He backs up before he was a junior officer and knows it well. Every single housing unit was exactly the same. White walls, white floor, white ceilings, burnt orange bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> That's what but anyway, there I was, and I ran out, I ran out of the carport and down into the street, and when they put the car in park, when she put the car in park, I pulled Clay out of his car seat and embraced him, embraced him tightly. And I begged forgiveness, and the walls of all my self-regard came tumbling down. The walls of my self-regard came tumbling down. You know, the story could have been different if the walls had come down earlier, right? Right? I mean, it could have been a very different story, a very different day. I could have been with the people I love. I could have been in the place where I needed to be. But no, those walls of willfulness all around me like this, like a fortress. I could have been like those pilgrims going to Jerusalem. It's an interesting, you know, 
But it's an interesting portrait. These pilgrims have been walking for days. The, the, the psalm that Paris read so beautifully just a moment ago. Um, you know, they've been walking for days. They're tired, they're dirty, they're hungry, and yet they're singing. They're singing. They're singing this song. It seemed like a dream, too good to be true, when God returned Zion's exiles. We laughed and we sang. We couldn't believe our good fortune. We laughed and we sang. We couldn't believe our good fortune. These folks, who are twice as tired as that young lieutenant coming out of the field, are sick. It's because their willfulness is dropped all around their ankles. And they, can, they can let loose. Praise, praise God. Praise the fact that they're alive. They're singing about their great grandparents. You know, the great grandparents were, were captive in the strongest nation in the world, Babylon. They were incarcerated there. The great grandparents never thought they were coming back, ever. And yet, God, in His mighty hand, made a super highway from Babylon back to Israel. And they came home. And the great grandparents came home, and, and the temple was in ruins, and the walls of Jerusalem were all rubble. And yet, they were singing. They were singing behind Governor Nehemiah. They were singing behind their great priest Ezra, filled with hope. And now, the great grandchildren are singing. They're singing the same song with great grandparents. Hey, it's, it's like a dream. Too good to be true, they sing. We could not believe our good fortune. God did not abandon our great grandparents, and He did not abandon us. They can sing because the walls of their self regard has come down. Come down. Same thing happens to Mary Magdalene, if you follow the story. Mary Magdalene. Goes, goes to the goes to the, to the cave tomb of Jesus while it's still dark. But the huge stone door has come tumbling down. And when she sees it, she runs back through Jerusalem, all through the streets, completely uninhibited. And she bangs on the door of the disciples. They're all locked in there because they're all enwrapped in self-preservation. They go knocking on the door. When they finally open, she goes, I've seen the Lord! I've seen the Lord! And they go, uh-huh. Oh, <laughs> Typical men. Like the ones handing the little Comanche court. You know, what, what uh, Scott reminded us, uh, us last night when the Easter Vigil was that we should never forget that Mary Magdalene was walking through a cemetery. She was in a place of death. She's walking through a cemetery and, and complete despair when she hears her name said as only one person in the universe can say it. Mary. Mary. It's the voice of Jesus whom she thought was dead. It's the voice of life when she thought had come to a dead end. It's the voice of Easter calling her back to life. And that sets her to running, right? Sets her to running. Nothing else matters. All the walls of self-preservation and self-advancement begin to kind of crumble. We can have the joy of Mary Magdalene today. We can have that joy today. But the walls have to come down. They do. They have to come down. It's interesting when I was writing this sermon for the second time, I have to be honest, I wrote this in I complete, I thought I was going to tweak the sermon on Monday. I just threw the old one out. It was tight. It was in my prayer book already. I was ready to go, and I knew it wasn't right, so I threw it away. And I started writing this one. And as I wrote it, I kept on having Matthew 24 pop into my head. Now, this is weird. Matthew 24 is about the rapture. All right? Now, I know the rapture is all the rage with Hollywood. You know, you know, I mean, it's a new, it's a new thing. You know, yes, he pushed the up elevator. He went up fast. Whoa, this prom queen, she's left out here to burn. You know, I mean, <laughs> and they're pulling some, they're pulling some monsters down to the earth that I don't think Bible even talks about. They're all, you know, they're everywhere. And uh, so anyway, if you're into that, please watch it. But that's not the way the Bible gets it. Uh, the Bible uh, in Matthew 24 reads something like this. Jesus says, "This." is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be working in the field. Two men will be working in the field. 
one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the meal. One will be taken, the other will be left. Therefore I tell you, says Jesus, stay awake. Stay awake. For you do not know the day when the Son of Man is coming. Okay? And I thought, okay, Lord, why are you giving me the scripture? And I finally got it. It's not just about the future. It's not just about the rapture. It's about right now. There are some people in this room. There are some other Christians who we know who have already been grasped by Christ. They've already been wrapped by Christ and taken to the higher ground of the resurrection. They're already living there, the higher plane. While the rest of us are kind of half living, marking our time like a lost first lieutenant on Comanche Court. We do not have to live that way. We do not have to live that way. We were meant to live at a higher place. But in order to do that, the walls of our willfulness must come down. They must come down. Because I'll tell you, the will is all about self-preservation and self-advancement. It's all about the self. And if it's all about the self, how does God really have a way to get in and change us? Listen, I'm, I'm speaking. I'm speaking as an authority on the will. Okay? <laughs> Alright, I am an authority. I'm, I'm a child of poverty. And I am the adult child of a violent alcoholic man. That's who I am. And I learned very young, very, very young, that, the, that if I could kick my will into overdrive, I could survive. Okay? I learned that. And I learned it better than almost anybody I know. Give me a job by God and it's going to get done. But the problem with the will and surviving by the will is that's all it is. It's just survival. It's not really living. It's not really living. You're left down here groveling. Kind of in a half-life. You're just sort of in a half-life. I know. God, God has to get in. Think, Mary Magdalene tries to tell us about the truth of Easter. She says, she tells us in her actions and her words. The resurrection is later and now. It's later and now. I mean, think about it. A voice from the grave calls out her name, Mary. The voice of the one whom she saw crucified calls out her name, Mary. The voice of life itself calls out her name, Mary. And then she knows death can never consume the love that comes from Christ, ever. I want you to think about this. A love so great that goes to the cross for you and me, and there's some beautiful people here, but the Lord knows we all need it. The love that goes to the cross cannot be covered up by anything. The love that made you a one-of-a-kind first edition cannot be eclipsed. You know, Rob and Scott and I and Brian have a great, we have great privilege every Sunday pretty much, except on Easter Sunday. We bring, we bring everyone who's having birthdays down here, we pray for them. We hold hands, and when I pray, I will say, Lord, thank you for making this one-of-a-kind first edition of each one of these human beings. I mean, I'm looking at you, and you are beautiful. There's only one of you. You know, there's only, there's only one Liza. There's, there's only one Nancy. There's only one Bill. There's only one Doug. It's one-of-a-kind. It's beautiful. Do we really think the love that made you is going to go away? Can we imagine it? Heavens, no. That's irrational. That love does not go away. We are not just a bunch of protoplasm that's been kind of knitted together and kind of came together. Oh, how groovy. No. That's absurd thing. The love that made you and even made me cannot go away. You know, as, as Paul says, Jesus Christ is the first fruits of those who have risen from the dead. He's just the first. We're coming later. <laughs> but let me tell you, the second is, all, is equally important. The resurrection is now. We are meant to live like Mary Magdalene today. Leaping, jumping, singing, acting the fool, exuberant living. We're meant to live that way now, no matter what our circumstance. No matter what it's like. 
I saw some of that yesterday. I was out here on the grounds. And I'll tell you, if you want to see Christ Church in action, you know, come on a Saturday and just watch how things work. We were having an Easter egg hunt, a Halita Easter egg hunt. We must have had, I have no idea how many young ones. We must have, we had enough eggs filled with candy to fuel the entire Polish army. <laughs> <laughs> and so you had all these children with their eggs. And you know, she has a little, she has a little bit of Easter egg hunt for the little babies. And for the ladies, you get older. I mean, you can be 50 years old and so be an Easter egg hunt. And she's got them in the trees. She's got them everywhere. The magic that she weaves. And so there's children everywhere. At the same time, we have the line of people going into the food bank. And they're the next generation. They're great grandparents' age. They're grandparents' age. And let me tell you what we're seeing in the food pantry right now. This is what's happening for us. The people lining up to get food, that's a week's worth of food or two weeks' worth of food, they're generally grandparents who are now raising their grandchildren. They didn't plan on that. They didn't wake up one day and say, oh, goody, can I spend my last years raising my grandchildren? No, it just happened. And so they have enough money to live on their own, but they don't have enough money to raise their grandchildren too. Those are the people coming to get food. What I saw was so, so beautiful. I saw this line of these folks coming in to get food, humbly, and they saw the children all around the same age as their grandchildren and, and their great-grandchildren, and they were just lifted up. Yeah. They were just lifted up. The people coming in to get food, the children getting eggs, kids from respite care getting kids, getting eggs, is that not a portrait of what God has in store for us? Is that a portrait of Easter? Say amen if you think so. Amen. It is. That's what God has fashioned us to be. Where people of different generations and different economic strata and different colors and different languages all come together in joy. Uninhibited and unbridled joy. That's the way we were meant to live. Why would we want to live down here? Why? I don't care what age you are. Why would we want to live down here and grow we weren't made for that. We we're made for something else. But in order to experience that, we have got to let our willfulness go. Let me tell you why specifically. You cannot will yourself into eternal life. You cannot rich your teeth and will yourself. I cannot will myself into eternal life. It is a gift. Solely, completely a gift. I don't know how many people I have buried here. I mean, I've been here for years, but I mean, I've buried a lot of people. Goodness great, no time to stop buried. And, you know, sometimes we bury people we don't know, and that's painful. But people always tell me, you know, she was a good person. Okay, I'm great, she was a good person. I, I, and I'm happy for that. But that, you can't will yourself into eternal life. It's a gift. It's completely a gift. We cannot will ourselves into the embrace of God. It's all grace. It's all grace. It's grace. We can't even will ourselves into forgiving another. Do you know that? I see this as the main stumbling block for every Christian today is forgiveness. People have really hurt us. I know that. There's a lot of pain out there. And a lot of us really up close. I know that. You tell me. I have my own balance of that. But you know you can't will yourself to forgive someone? No, you have to receive the Holy Spirit to do that. And then you can let it go. You just let it go. I'll never forget. I, I didn't say this in the sermon yet. But I was 21 years old. I was married to Kay. Um, about a year. 22, I guess. And I, I, was, I was going out the door one day, and I realized if I did not forgive my father, if I did not forgive my father, I would never be a whole person. Never. My father would come home and stuff me upside down in the trash can. My father would kick me across the table. My father would wake me up in the middle of the night and say, why did I saw off your mother's head? That was my day. But then, on that day, Kate had already left work. She's already in our administration. She's already in our end age. God knows, 18 or something. Uh, you know, she had the highest grade in the whole state of Alabama. She had something else. Life in my life. But I was Kay had left the work. I was by myself. And I was overcome with the knowledge that I had to forgive my father. 
I would I'd never be a decent husband. I would never, I certainly would never be a priest. Goodness gracious. And suddenly the Lord gave me the power. I mean, I was able to release it all. I was able to forgive him. I was able to tell him. I buried it. Goodness gracious. But that's supernatural. It's, you can't will yourself to do that. Believe me. And you cannot will yourself to be authentically generous. And I'm not talking about you people that have lots of money and people that don't have I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you cannot be an open-handed person unless, unless you and I die to self. That's why Jesus says you've got to die to self. You've got to die to self to be a full self. You know, was, this morning as I was running, I, I, I realized that I, I remember the story of the 19th chapter, 19th chapter of Matthew where the, where the young man runs up, runs up to Jesus. You know, he runs up to Jesus. Hey, hey, teacher, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you know the commandments. The guy says, yeah, he rattled off a couple. And then Jesus says, oh, yeah. And by the way, um, sell what you have and come, come and be with me. Come and be with me. <coughs> and the man no longer runs. He walks back like this. It wasn't about how much was in his wallet, okay? It wasn't about his bank account. It was about that which he had put between him and God. It's about all those things we put around ourselves that keeps God from getting in. We have that power. But it can go away. It can go away. Uh, a psychologist I'm reading right now, a Christian psychologist says, that will willfulness is is the deadly fruit that leads to the kingdom of self. But willingness, willingness is the river that runs through the kingdom of God. Willingness. We can be different. So today, to you, people, so many of you I know so well and love so much. And people that are new here, I hope you know you that way. I want to tell you right now about Christ has broken through the impenetrable rock of death. He has broken through that rock. And He is racing through, He is running through that road as the ramparts of our own, own fortress begin to come down. He's racing, He is running to you and to me to give us life give us Easter, to give us hope, and to give us joy.